Well, good morning again. And uh, for those of you that were not with us last week, I want to wish you a happy new year. And I, and I made a comment last week at last week's service, and it was true last week, but I was curious since we were going to have more people this week if it would be equally true. And I'm pleased to say it's equally true. And I'll just tell you all, you look really good in 2022. You look great in 2023. Now, one of the things that we have been talking about over the last several weeks is getting ready for the new year. And once again, we've decided as a church to have a sign up for whoever would want to do this, but really encouraging all of us in the direction of reading through the Bible in a year. Uh, this past Friday, I received a, a very warm and, and really it was a text of gratitude. And in this text, uh, it referred to reading through the Bible. Now, now, this person now lives several states away. They're no longer part of our church, but they, where they are now living in Florida, have found a really good church. And guess what? Their church is reading through the Bible. And in this text, she asked me a question. She said, Pastor Tim, how many years have you been reading through the Bible at Walkersville Community Church? Because she was there for the very first one. She, she said, how many years ago has this been? And my honest answer was, I have no idea. And the reason why I have no idea is that it was never meant to be perennial. We chose this for a specific year, a specific focus, said as a church, we are going to read through the Bible but then as we began to read through the Bible and people were interacting on it, about it on our Facebook page, what we were hearing, the feedback we were hearing from people was this. This is changing my life. So we did it again the next year and the next year and the next year. So we're doing it this year. I have no, no idea how many years um, we've been doing this. Reading God's Word, God's Word puts us in touch with the living Word, Jesus, who changes human lives. But let's admit this morning, can you admit this with me? Just because reading through the Bible changes our lives, that doesn't mean, does it, that reading through the Bible is easy. Have you noticed that the stuff that are, is worthwhile in life, the things in life that change us, it's seldom easy. We want it to be, but that's not the case, is it? Marriage will change your life, but is marriage always easy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise will change your life. But is exercise easy? Some people are putting their head down like I've already given up on that resolution. <laughs> I saw a sign, by the way, on New Year's. It was a day or two after New Year's, and it said this. I loved it because it's so true. It says, my goal this past year was to lose 10 pounds, only 13 to go. <laughs> Doesn't that describe sometimes? Our, because it's not easy. Being a parent will change your life, but it's not easy. When all of our kids were with us just a couple of weeks ago, we were kind of reliving memories, and I'll never forget. It, it, was, it was a crying shame back then. It's now a funny moment. I'll never forget pushing a, a shopping cart through Kmart with two of my kids in there, and it was in the middle of the store that a stomach bug decided to manifest itself. It wasn't easy. In fact, it's kind of hard because we don't want to just say, here, read, read this. It'll change your life. It's a pretty thick book, right? But there's almost like this, this attitude sometimes. It's like, here, read this. It will change your life. By the way, it's divided into two parts, one called the Old Testament, one called the New Testament. But you'll get to that later. Oh, and it's not a single book. It's actually a collection of 66 books. But you'll figure that out, too. And uh, 
Oh, by the way, it was written by over 40 authors in a time span of nearly 2,000 years on three continents and three languages. Have fun. <laughs> Let's face it, reading the Bible can be a little bit intimidating. So what I wanted to do this year is give us some tools because it's easy to read the Bible and not think of the big picture of the Bible. It's easy to read the Bible and kind of, if, if we do that, we can often take something in the wrong direction. So what I wanted to do, my challenge to myself in December, and I told the staff this, was I want to come up with a tool or tools that if you would so choose, you could put this sheet of paper in your Bible so that when you start reading through the Bible, and you get to one of those places where you're scratching your head and you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, you're wondering, why is this even in the Bible? You know, there's things in the Bible that were hard to put in the Bible even back then. You can take this tool out and say, okay, this is how this piece of the puzzle fits into the larger puzzle. It's just like I shared last week that somebody, if somebody does a thousand piece puzzle and they put all 999 pieces together but have yet to find the one under the couch and they frame that, what are you going to see? You're going to see the one missing piece, right? So that is what I will attempt to do today as well as last week. Now last week uh, I did something that I've never done in 30 33 years, and that is I didn't get through my outline. So last week's message was kind of a, a to be continued. And just to give you a little bit of, of uh, some things that we learned, some things that we looked at as we were jumping into reading through the Bible in 2023, we saw that the Bible was written for us, but the Bible was not written to us. And now, we fit into the larger story, but it was not written to us, it was written for us. We saw that the Bible was first a story of God calling this people Israel, creating this people called Israel, calling them to be his people. And then we looked at Mark chapter 12 and how the first eight books of the Bible, by the way, Mark 12 is a text of scripture that you should have out you should have it highlighted checked off whatever because it is a text of scripture where Jesus gives a parable to the religious leaders of this day, his day it is kind of a blistering parable against religious leadership of his day but what Jesus has done for us is has given us a parable that we can fit all the books of the Bible in somewhere. And last week we saw just the very first verse of this parable, how the first eight books of the Bible fit in. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. We're reading verses 1 through 12. And by the way, this parable is also in Matthew and it's also in Luke, which means that this was a parable that was told again and again and again and remembered again and again as the Jesus stories were, were told uh, orally in communities. The parable of the tenants. So here's verse 1. This is what we saw. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth fit into this one verse. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press, and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. 
Finally, he said, sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. Why? For they perceived that he had told this parable against them. So they left him and went away. So last week, again, we saw that, that to first century Jews, anything that would relate to a vineyard, any parable about a vineyard, they, they would immediately know he's talking about us. He's talking about Israel. And last week we saw how, how God called this people, called a man by the name of Abraham, promised him, uh, promised him to make his name great, promised him land, promised him that through you, Abraham, you will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. We saw how Genesis challenge that. The rest of Genesis was a challenge to those things. Um, so we're picking up in verse 2. I'll read these again because this brings us to kind of like the second... If, if this was a play, if this was a drama, Act 1 would be Israel being created and called by God. Act 2 would be this. The Bible is a story of Israel's rejection of her divine calling, her rejection of God, her rejection of those that God sent to her. One of the key key chapters, and and again, throughout this, what I want to do is give you either key, key verses or key chapters. And what makes these things key chapters or key verses is that when we understand this one chapter, reading this one chapter, understanding what it's about, will, helps us make a whole lot of sense out of the rest of the Bible or the rest of the Old Testament. And we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God had this agreement. I want to bless you. His heart was to bless. His heart was to make this people a blessing in all the earth. But he gave them this agreement. We call it a covenant. And he said, this is what I want to do. I want to bless you. I want my blessings to overtake you. I want you to be my voice to the world. Uh, But if you disobey, then this will be the consequences. And much of the Old Testament is Israel not following their God, but going astray and facing the very things that Deuteronomy 28 talks about. So verse 2 says, when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, and they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully, and he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. What we have here is is a bird's eye view of Israel rejecting God by rejecting those that God sent to them. And as a result, basically what would happen to Israel, and and this is important for us to know because this is the backdrop to Jesus coming. This is a backdrop to our Savior coming. What happened in the garden to one man and one woman where where they were in relationship with God and that relationship was broken and then they were exiled from the Garden of Eden would now be repeated to an entire people. And I want to show you how how the Old Testament ends. In our Bibles, if you look at this, if you look at our Bibles, the way we read the Bible is... The Old Testament is arranged by themes. It's arranged by subjects. If you look at your outline sheet, you see that there's some uh, historical books that we're going to look at. Then there's wisdom, what is called wisdom literature. 
then we have what's called major prophets, minor prophets, and then our Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi. So we have arranged, our English Bibles are arranged by the subjects. That is not how the Jews arranged their Bible. They only had three sections. The first one was the Torah, the first five books. Uh, the second one was called the Nevim, which is the prophets. And then the third part was the Kedavim, which is, which is the writings. So I want you to listen to these words from 2 Chronicles 36, verses 15 and 16, because this is how the Old Testament ends. And in fact, if, whether you read it from 2 Chronicles or you read it from our English Bible, Malachi, you find out that it's a story without an ending, a story that's desperate for an ending. Here's what 2 Chronicles says. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them. Does this sound like Jesus' words, by the way? Sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But what they do, they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. And the rest of the rest of Second Chronicles, after that bad news, it gets worse because it speaks of exile, it speaks of their temple being destroyed, it speaks of their land being destroyed. In other words, God's promises to Abraham are, th- are in threat. How, how is this people of God going to fulfill these promises of being a blessing to the earth when they themselves are slaves? So let's look at the historical books continued. Again, this story of Israel. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Here's some of the things going on there, by the way. First and second Samuel and first and second Kings, uh, four books in our Bible were two books originally. Israel rejects God as king, sets up a king to be like the nations. Now, what's fascinating about, and those of you that have read uh, these books uh, of Kings and Samuel, it's kind of like, it kind of like messes with your mind because there's parts of it where it seems like wanting a king is the worst idea in the world. God is not in favor of this. How could you do such a thing? And then there's other parts where it seems like God is saying, you know, this wasn't my idea, but I'm going to use this somehow. And you're like, okay, well, maybe this is not that bad of a thing after all. Um, The problem was not that they wanted to set up a king, but they wanted to be like the nations. Then we have Saul, David, Solomon rule over this united kingdom. Then there's like civil war. The kingdom's divided in two. Now we've got the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And, you know, those kings that we just talked about, those kings that Israel wanted to make themselves like the nation, out of all the kings of both Israel in the north and Judah in the south, you, there were just a couple of them that were pretty good kings. In fact, the rest of them took Israel away from God. In other words, the handwriting is on the wall for both kingdoms to be exiled from their homeland. It's the Garden of Eden all over again. And when this people would go back and read their ancient story way back in Genesis 3, they saw themselves there because that was the story that they were living. Then we have 1 and 2 Chronicles. Now, again, if you read these books, you're going to notice that 1 and 2 Chronicles sound a lot like the, the kings. And the reason for that is they sound a lot like the kings because a lot of the material is the same. But one thing that Chronicle, Second Chronicles does is, is even though Israel in, is in this bad shape, even though they have no idea how are we going to get out of this, and, and different, different sects of Judaism had different ways of, of going about that, there was still this hope that God would restore, that God would be true to the promises. After First and Second Chronicles, you'll come to a book by the name of Ezra. Ezra is post-exilic, meaning it is after the exile. And 
uh, records the rebuilding of the temple. The rebuilding of the see. When that temple was destroyed, the place where God dwelt was destroyed. And, and the things that were most precious, most holy, were taken away captive. And what the Assyrians and then the Babylonians were saying with that was our God is greater than your God. Our God is greater than Yahweh. Then we have Nehemiah, another post-exilic book of reading, of rebuilding of the destroyed city walls. So, in other words, at this point, they're getting a little bit of hope, right? They're, okay, things are really bad, and we've sinned against God, and this is what has happened to us. But now we're, we're kind of coming back into the land. Now we're building the wall. We're building the temple. We're, we're getting back to where we were. But here's the problem. Here's another key verse that, that you can highlight, underline, star, so that every time you read through the Bible, every time you read through Nehemiah, and you come to this verse, you will know what Israel was dealing with, not only in the time of Nehemiah, but up until the time of Christ. Here's what Nehemiah says. Remember, this is post-exile. They're in their land. They've got, they're, they're rebuilding the wall. Behold, we are slaves to this day. In fact, this is a prayer that, that Nehemiah is pouring out to God. Behold, we are slaves to this day. In the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its gifts, behold, we are slaves. In other words, it's almost like we've gone back to Egypt. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. They realize it, this is because of our sin. By, by the way, you know, when, when Jesus taught us to pray, taught his disciples to pray, taught the first century Jews to pray, uh, forgive us our trespasses. That was more than just, I lost my temper this week, Lord, please forgive me. Forgiveness, forgiveness would be seen in Israel's restoration. Then we have this great book called Esther. How many of you love the book of Esther? Anyone love Esther? Esther Esther was kind of like one of these books that they didn't know what to do with. What do we do with this? What do we do with Esther? Because at that time, of course, this is about a woman. So what do we do with that? And not only is it it about a, a woman, but no New Testament author quotes Esther or alludes to Esther. And to make things worse, you read the book of Esther from cover to cover, there is no mention of God whatsoever. But I am so glad that Esther was included because Esther is a book of hope. It's a book of restoration. It's a book of no matter how bad things have gotten, Trust in your God, and he will deliver you. What we have in the book of Esther, get this, is even though there is no mention of God, the most mentioned person in the book of Esther is not Esther. It's not her cousin Mordecai. It is a foreign king who has dominion over God's people. And I think that what that is saying to us, is saying that this foreign king has now replaced God in the lives of the people. He's ruling over them. Then we come to wisdom literature, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song. These are called wisdom literature, wisdom books. They show Israel how to worship, how to live before her God, and also the foolishness of not doing so. Then we come into what is called the minor prophets. And again, all this is fitting into Jesus' story about God calling Israel 
and that call being rejected because the servant would be sent and again and again and again and they would reject them and treat them shamefully and kill some of them and beat others. So all, all that to say, it was unmistakable what Jesus was talking about when these religious leaders were listening to him. Major prophets are referred to as major prophets due to their length. So it's going to take you some time to get through some of these. Isaiah's a long book. Uh, Jeremiah's a long book. It's going to take you a while to get through them. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Uh, Daniel. What, what do you know about Daniel? What, what comes to mind immediately when you think of Daniel? Daniel in the lion's den. Okay, what other thing? There's another story that, that is right up there with the Daniel in the lion's den. Shadrach, yeah, that's good too, writing on the wall. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? He said, if you don't bow down to this idol, you're going to be destroyed. Daniel, if you don't stop worshiping being your God by praying three times a day, you will be destroyed. And what God is communicating through that book is, I will deliver you. You are my people. There's hope in store. There's restoration in store. I will deliver you no matter how many fiery furnaces you go through. No matter how many lions that you face. And then we come to, to what is called the minor prophets. They're minor not because they're less important. They're minor because their books are pretty short. So where it took you a while to get, it's almost like you, you've earned it by reading through the major prophets, going through books that are really long, now you get to, to these 12, what is called 12 minor prophets. Um, you've got the book of, of Hosea. Uh, Hosea, by the way, by the time of, of Hosea's writing, there, there was this imagery of marriage that was being used by the prophets, that it was like God was in a marriage relationship with his people, but... His people had become the unfaithful bride. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. How many of you like the book of Jonah? What do we see in Jonah? It's, it's in, in Jonah, we see, we see part of that Abrahamic promise coming about, being a blessing to the nations, even those outside of Israel. It also points forward, doesn't it, to the first time, the first time the word love is used in the New Testament comes from Jesus' lips, where he says to his followers, love your enemies. And it's almost like Jonah is pointing forward to that. Uh, Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Malachi has this hope of restoration that God will come suddenly to his, his temple. Because remember from Nehemiah, they're back. It looks like things are moving in the right direction, but they're still slaves. And the Old Testament closes as a story without an ending. In fact, in, in one of my Bibles, I have written in the book of Malachi, after the last chapter, these words, to be continued. To be continued. Because that, that plight that Nehemiah spoke about over 400 years prior to Jesus would continue century after century after century. And while there's gaps that are filled in through, through these books that were written called the Apocrypha, it's still a story that is longing for God to act and bring the story to completion. Now, next week, we're going to find out how God brought the story to completion by saying, I have yet another servant. I have my son. I will send him. They will, re he, they will respect my son. So enter Jesus into the world is the completion of Israel's story and, and hope for the world. In other words, all those promises have been threatened, will be fulfilled in this person named Jesus. Uh, I'll close with this. Um, one of my favorite Christmas songs, and not, not um, by, the, by the lyrics, 
not necessarily to sing, uh, but, but by the, the lyrics, because, because so many of our, our Christmas carols don't bring in the greater picture. But O come, O come, Emmanuel brings what the story of Christmas and Jesus coming is all about. O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Next week we'll pick up looking at the rest of the parable and how Jesus fits, fits into that. You probably already saw it when we, when we read the parable. So let's pray. Yeah, come on up. I just wanted to give a testimony um, because I know you can sit and listen to a sermon like this and be like, oh shoot, I'm not even, you know, like I'm not even on the radar with this. And I do know how long we've done this because it has coincided that the first time we did this initiative together, I had just turned 50. And I stood before you and said, confessions of a real pastor's wife, I have never been able to complete reading through the Bible. I, I just, I start out and usually by March, I peter out. And, but I, I knew doing this in community would be helpful, and it was, which is why this is so important. And I want to tell you, as I started my 50th year, and I, I just wanted to do it, and it has continued and continued and continued, and this is now my fifth year doing this. And this is what it does for me. I don't know all of this. I, I, this is amazing, and it's important because here is what our culture has allowed. Our culture has allowed us to pick and choose verses throughout the word so that it will tell us whatever we want to believe. Mm -hmm. And that is dangerous. It is just enough truth to deceive. And we know from Genesis, how did, how did the devil come in to Eve? He didn't come in blatantly with lies. He came in with just enough truth to deceive. And that's why it's really important to know the, the whole of the Bible and to read the whole of the Bible. There is a scripture in Ephesians 5 that says Jesus makes us holy and cleanses us by the washing of of the word. And I read that as I was journeying through my first year of reading through the Bible, and I said, that's what you're doing. I don't always have these warm fuzzies every day that I'm understanding. And even by evening, you might say, did you read your Bible? And I'm going to be able to say yes, and I'm going to be able to tell you where I'm read but I might not be able to remember exactly everything I read. That's just my reality. But just like I get in the shower daily and I wash my physical body, I might not know everything that is being washed away from me, the germs, bacteria, I might not know, but the water does its work. That's why I do this, because the word does its work. And I have continued, not because I'm a pastor's wife, or not even because now I'm feeling that call into pastoring, but I do that because I know I am so inundated by our culture that I have to be washed by the word if I'm going to live and have my being in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. it, there, it, there's too much that will pull me the, the other way. And that, 
is really scary. And if we don't have it, then we have nothing to give our children and now our grandchildren. And they need something to stand on. My dad always used to tell us, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. And this is what I'm standing on, not just the things that are comfortable, mm. not just the things that I want to pick and choose, but all of it. And it reads me, and sometimes it offends me, and I don't know how to do this. But Jesus walks us through, and it's important to have all of the picture, and Tim unpacks that in beautiful ways. But if your brain's frying a little bit, I get that. But what if this is the first step that Jesus invite, is inviting you into to say, has this been working for you? However you've been trying to get, you know, what if you tried something new? So I just want to encourage you in that. It is powerful. I, I can't explain it. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. But if you set the discipline it will change your life. And I will promise you that. You try this for a year and come back to me and tell me if it has not changed your life. Amen. Because that's never happened. Amen. Why don't you pray for us, Beth? Let's do that. Um, and then we're going to say. And you, so you said that we um, This is start, our fifth year. I was going to say, how old are you? I'm well, <laughs> I am 54, and I started when I'm 50, so as I've gone through... By, yes. by the way, at that exact same service, best parents were with us. In fact, I think it was the last time they were with us. Yes. And uh, her mom got up and shared uh, how she had just read through the Bible for the first time. And so. so did my dad. And that is the only time in my life that my father, as a pastor, spoke... My husband, as a pastor, spoke. I spoke. And my mother, who never spoke, got up and shared. Because this is something that has been modeled for me. And it took me till I was 50. And it took my mom, she was 65, the first time she read through. She did it the year she retired. Hmm. And as we, we did that, do you know our daughters? heard and for the first time they were in their 20s and they read the word through that first year and i was just like let that's what this is passing on to the next generation wherever we are wherever we start Amen. So, let's pray. so let's stand and then we will worship and father we thank you and God, I thank you for every single person here because it was not a mistake for anyone here. And anyone that is struggling, thinking, this is just not for me, this is, God, I pray for the truth to lead us all. And maybe there's something a little different. Or maybe we have a discipline that has just become, we're not even paying attention anymore and you wanna change the discipline. God, we just wanna be open because your word washes us. And it can't just be a once a week thing. Just like we don't, most of us probably don't take a shower once a week. But daily, God, we need to be washed by your word. And so Father, we ask for the Holy Spirit to come and to just speak to our hearts and our minds and even after this service, if, if there's something that you just want to come get prayer for or get encouragement or just say, how do I start? We're here. We're available. Let's do this together. Father, come and visit us in a new way in 2023 this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.